Hello. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is Robert Nozick's uh, theory of distributive justice that he calls the Enlightenment theory. Uh, this here is Robert Nozick. Uh, again, a uh, picture in black and white means uh, he is no longer with us. Uh, you see he died in 2002, actually within a couple of months of uh, the subject of the last lecture, uh, uh, John Rawls. Uh, he, like Rawls, also spent most of his career at Harvard. Uh, the two were sort of, you know, notorious frenemies, right? I'm sure they got along just fine. Um, they, uh, you know, sort of work together and, and, and to some extent owe their careers to each other for starting uh, this, this tremendously fruitful dialogue uh, that in many ways is still with us. Uh, Nozick is famous for a number of, of important philosophical writings, uh, but for distributive justice, his important writing is a book called Anarchy, State, and Utopia, published in 1974. If you recall, uh, John Rawls's A Theory of Justice was published in 1971. Uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia is often considered to be a kind of response uh, to, uh, to Rawls. And so as such, uh, we're, we're going to sort of let uh, uh, Nozick respond to Rawls, uh, and then we're going to try and, and, and give uh, Rawls at least some uh, plausible counter so that you can see uh, the way that the dialogue between these two thinkers really informs uh, a lot of current debates about uh, distributive justice. So Nozick calls his theory the entitlement theory, right? Um, because it's a theory of what people are entitled to. Again, you know, philosophers are really good at naming things. And so the entitlement theory itself is very, very simple. It only takes about five minutes to uh, present uh, uh, Nozick's theory, uh, but it takes a little bit longer to try and explain why it's so different from other kinds of theories. Uh, and then, of course, why one might prefer a theory like Nozick's as opposed to somebody else's. Uh, this is sort of the exact reverse of roles, which is an awful lot of buildup. And then once we get all that buildup done, uh, then the theory itself takes uh, just a few minutes, but you can't really get there without all the buildup. Uh, this one sort of unfolds the other way. The first, uh, uh, the first element of the entitlement theory is this first principle here. Uh, this is called the principle of justice in acquisition. And it says that things, like, you know, and again, not just material things or physical things, but things generally, uh, things uh, that are, are justly acquired are justly held. Right. And Nozick is uh, in the reading, he, he says he, he glosses over a lot of the detail here, and that's fine. He's just providing a large scale theory. Um, you know, he says that, look, he, he talks about acquiring something means what happens to make something pass from an unheld state into a held state. Right. That's what the, the basic definition of acquisition. Um, and again, we have, uh, you know, how is it that come things, you know, come to come to be owned if they were not owned before? That's a, another way to put the question. Um, and you could have a lot of different answers to this, uh, perhaps something like like Locke's theory of property. Um, Nozick himself thought Locke's theory of property was a little problematic in some particular ways. Um, but, you know, he proposed some other things. Again, we're going to gloss over a lot of the details here. We're going to say whatever plausible rules of acquisition there are, whatever process uh, is, is, is a fair process for turning something that isn't owned by anybody into a process where it is owned by somebody, that's what he means here. And so, so, so whatever falls into that category, uh, if it is justly acquired, it's justly held. That's all that Nozick wants to establish at this point is that if it is justly acquired, it's justly held, right? Principle number one. Principle number two is things that are justly transferred are justly held. And if you think about it, again, I think we have a pretty good idea of what Nozick must mean by uh, things that are justly acquired. Um, so, I mean, if you think to yourself, okay, can I think of an example of a way of transferring something that is uh, having one person have it, then having somebody else have it, that seems unjust, obviously. Uh, I think the first uh, thing that will come to mind, and it'll come to mind pretty quickly, is uh, theft, right? I mean, this is, seems like the paradigm case of unjust transfer. If somebody just steals somebody, then it's not fair that they have it. OK, but now think of other ways of, tra of transferring things that seem perfectly fine. OK, and again, you're probably going to come up with several examples. Uh, if you know, I would encourage you to pause the video for a second. Think of several examples, right, of kinds of transfer that seem perfectly fair, perfectly OK, uh, perfectly just. OK, so among the examples, you, you certainly should have thought of exchange. OK, so uh, the, the idea is like some form of trade or purchase or something like that. So the idea is, you know, I give you five dollars, you give me a taco, right? Uh, you know, or 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 the reverse. Uh, that's a kind of bargain. That seems like you know you're entitled to the five dollars. I'm entitled to the taco, right? That's um, uh, perfectly fine. Uh, 
uh, you might have considered something like inheritance, right? This is one form of gift, right? If you just give something to somebody, it's perfectly fair that they have it. And so uh, gift, uh, exchange, uh, you know, voluntary exchange, those sorts of things are, 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 are some easy examples of just transfers, uh, the transfers that are perfectly fair in and of themselves. And believe it or not, that's just about it. There's just one thing we're going to add to a complete Nozick entitlement theory. Nozick's theory is that a, a just distribution, right? This is when you're looking at the whole of society and looking how things are distributed. He says, a just distribution is the one where all holdings, all the things that people have, are held through iterations of one, the principle of justice in acquisition, and two, the principle of justice in transfer. And so if you look at a distribution and everything in that distribution was justly acquired and then justly transferred uh, all the way along down the line, it seems to be perfectly fine that everybody should have uh, that thing. Now, this is a very, uh, it sounds very simple and it is, right? It's a, it's a very, um, it's admirably simple uh, in its construction. And of course, there's a lot of detail glossed over, but the detail at this point in the theory, at this level of abstraction isn't very important. Uh, what Nozick is, is giving us here is a kind of theory of justice uh, that deals a lot more with process than outcome. And that's the, the important thing to see about this. And that's what we're gonna end up discussing here, here in a second. The first thing we want to take a look at in terms of what, uh, when you're examining Nozick's theory, is what sort of notable differences Nozick's theory has uh, with many other theories of justice. Uh, this is something that Nozick himself was, uh, you know, very careful to point out, and, and you'll see this, uh, of course, in the reading, uh, where he talks about patterned or current time slice theories of justice, right? This is some, some jargon here, uh, but the thing is, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to explain. Okay, so a patterned or current time slice theory of justice, and I, I would say most theories of justice uh, or, or many theories of justice are this way, uh, Nozick thinks most. Uh, the patterned or current time slice theory of justice says that justice is about how things are at any given time rather than how they got that way. Right. And so the idea is what you're doing is you're looking at some some the way things are in a place in a distribution at some given time and using however things are to say whether or not it's a just situation. So you want, you're want you using facts about the way the situation is, how it turned out uh, to, to say something about whether the system is just or not. And so in other words, if, if some distribution fits a just pattern, then that distribution is itself just. Okay, that's uh, why, why he calls it this patterned theory. He also calls it a current time slice theory, because again, you're looking at how things are at some given time. Nozick uh, thinks that such uh, approaches to justice are mistaken, even though very common. Uh, instead, he provides the entitlement theory, which he claims is an historical theory of justice. And so how is that different? An historical theory of justice is about how things got to be the way that they are rather than how they are at any given time, right? So an historical theory of justice is going to focus on process rather than outcome. The pattern theory is going to focus on outcome rather than process. So in other words, if some distribution got to be the way it is following individually just steps, then that distribution is just. Okay, so that's the difference between Nozick's theory of justice and many other kinds of theory of justice. So to get an idea of what a patterned theory really kind of looks like, uh, I think it's useful uh, to see some examples uh, of, of why he really calls this a patterned theory, because sometimes that's not obvious. So for example, um, uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the examples I often like to use for this one is just imagine we've decided you're, you're in a whole room full of people, you know, it, it's safe now, right? Uh, you're in a whole room full of people and it's it, and, and you've ordered pizzas, right? And a certain number of pizzas arrive. And the idea is that you want to come up with some fair way of distributing the pizza. So now you have a microcosm, like a little a little tiny example of what a, a theory of social distribution, or theory of distributive justice should be like. It should be a theory about the best way to distribute this pizza, okay? And so you're left with a couple of questions. So we could come up with some method for distributing it, or we could uh, just focus on like who who has how much pizza, okay? Uh, it's the pattern view that will focus on who has how much pizza and why, uh, and it's the historical uh, uh, account that's gonna say, how did it come about that, that, that people had the pizza that they have, okay? And so one of the one of the things that people will often propose in such a simple situation as dividing pizza up among people in a room is to say, okay, uh, how about you just make sure everybody gets the same amount of pizza, 
Okay, this is what we would call an equality pattern, and it's a very it's the very simplest of all possible patterns here. And in some certain circumstances, especially very simple circumstances, it strikes us as quite fair. Okay, uh, now of course, if we're dealing with an entire society with all of the various different goods, uh, the simple equality pattern is too simple. It, it doesn't it doesn't get enough nuance to really get across all of the different things that are valuable in a society and all of the uh, the different sort of trade offs and, and and nuances that there can be in constructing a social distribution. But again, the idea is if you look at at this room full of, of, of people and you say, ah, well, any distribution in which uh, some people have more pizza than others is one that doesn't fit the equality pattern, and so it is unjust, right? If the equality pattern is, is your, your, your theory of justice. But of course, there are other patterns. Uh, again, uh, pause the video for a second and think to yourself, what other ways are there, right, of, dis of, of distributing the pizza that you think also seem fair or reasonable? Okay. If you've taken a few seconds to do that, you've probably thought of at least some of these. Uh, for example, some kind of merit-based pattern, right? I mean, and, and of course you could use, uh, there are many dimensions of merit. You could say, okay, the nicest people uh, get more pizza uh, and, and meaner people get less, right? So the idea is this, you say, okay, the nicer you are, the more pizza you get. And so what you're doing is you're setting up a situation in which you could look, right, at the distribution of pizza. And if you saw some, some you, know, you would... When you see that some people have more pizza than others, if it's for any reason other than that they're nicer than others, well, then then this distribution doesn't fit your merit pattern and thus would be unjust. OK, maybe uh, we're di distributing pizza on the basis of everybody's last uh, quiz or exam score. Right. That would be a kind of merit. Right. Uh, that would be a way of explaining why some would have more than others. And if if the distribution actually fits that pattern, one would say that it's just right. Um, uh, so anyway, you could you could think of merit uh, in, in many, many different ways. OK. You could also, uh, you also might have thought of a need pattern. This makes some sense with pizza. Perhaps you let uh, the people who are hungriest have the most pizza, right? Um, so the idea is if some people had more pizza, uh, it's because they were hungrier than the people who had less, right? That that sounds perfectly reasonable. Um, to some level, at a very at a very basic level, this was actually uh, Marx's theory of justice, right? Uh, he thought that. Uh, um, uh, there was a well. This is part of uh, part of Marx's theory of justice. Part of it was uh, he thought that the distribution should be sensitive to need, right? That uh, people should get more if they sort of need more. Um, and uh, he also thought that uh, there was a, another there was a sort of merit-based aspect. He thought whoever puts in the most amount of work, right, the total total amount of work, quantity of work, uh, should should uh, uh, merit sort of extra benefits. Uh, those and you know it, it's not an obviously stupid idea. Uh, but uh, but of course you know the way that he sort of thought about it ends up running to at least some problems. But in any case, these are all uh, various patterns, and of course I think it's worth noting that Rawls's theory itself is also a pattern theory of justice. But Rawls has before us a very complex pattern. It's not so simple as equality or merit or need or something like that. Uh, instead, uh, the pattern that Rawls has in mind is that. A, a, a distribution is just if it's the kind of distribution that would be chosen by anybody behind the veil of ignorance, right? That's a very complex pattern for something to fit, but, but the idea is what you're doing is you're looking at the way a distribution turned out and using facts about how it turned out uh, to say whether it's just or not, right? Uh, you're, you're looking at an end state or a current time slice, right? A moment in time and, and taking a look at it. Whereas uh, Nozick is going to be much more concerned with uh, the process by which uh, uh, societies operate rather than, uh, you know, w what, it, what it looks like. Okay, so that's one of the biggest differences between uh, Nozick's view uh, and other views, including Rawls's view. But of course, uh, the fact that these views are different uh, doesn't yet say anything about why one of these views should be any better or, or worse than another. And so that's what we'll take a look at next. This, so uh, Nozick is going to uh, present now an argument for why one ought to prefer an historical theory of justice to a patterned or, or t current time slice theory of justice, uh, like, for example, Rawls's theory. Uh, his, this argument is, is pretty famous, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's called the um, 
Uh, it's called the Wilt Chamberlain argument uh, because it uses Wilt Chamberlain as an example. And if you don't know who Wilt Chamberlain was, uh, uh, Wilt Chamberlain was a, a, a basketball player. Um, he uh, uh, played his uh, college basketball at the University of Kansas, which is where he's pictured here. Uh, you can see he's uh, sort of uh, dunking the ball with authority while a bunch of uh, far inferior athletes just kind of stand back and try not to get hurt. Um, that's kind of how Wilt played much of his career. In fact, the, the three second rule that uh, only allows offensive players to stay in the lane for three seconds at a time. Uh, you could also, I think, probably call that the Wilt Chamberlain rule. Um, uh, he actually once uh, scored 100 points in a professional game, right, playing against other professionals. Um, and uh, I think he had something like 50-some rebounds in that game as well. It was uh, uh, kind of crazy. Um, so in any case, that you know, uh, Wilt was a big deal. And when uh, Nozick was writing the book, uh, Wilt was one of the most famous uh, athletes in the world. So uh, you know, it, it, he lends himself well to this particular example. Yeah, you know, he's certainly famous. So in any case, um, uh, you know, Wilt was a really good basketball player. But that's that's all you really need to know about Wilt for this example to go is that he was a good basketball player. He may as well have been a fictitious character for the purposes of this argument. The argument will do what it does. So here's here's the way the argument goes. So uh, Nozick asks you to imagine some distribution, some way that society has distributed its its, uh, its, its all of its goods, access, authority, wealth, etc., all that stuff. Um, call that distribution D1. The D is for distribution, of course. And and imagine that D1 fits whatever your favorite pattern is. Maybe it's Rawls's pattern. Maybe it's a merit pattern. Maybe it's the plain old equality pattern. Whatever, right? Uh, just uh, imagine it fits whatever your favorite pattern is. Uh, if you reflect to yourself, gosh, how do I think that all of society's goods should be divided up among the people in society? Again, whatever your answer to that is, assume that's D1. Okay? So far, so good. Now imagine that Wilt Chamberlain, a basketball player, a famous one, signs a contract, right, of his own free will. And again, people offer this contract freely. Everyone's a free agent here. Um, so imagine that Wilt signs a contract uh, with the owners of some basketball team and that that they, the contract says that, that he will get 25 cents from every ticket purchased to see his team's home games. OK, um, so. You know, imagine people, you know, will will go to a game and they will, um, you know, pay whatever the ticket costs. Like, again, if the if the total price of admission is worth it to them and in effect, in effect, they're putting a 25 cents uh, into a special you know, box with Will's name on it. That's it's essentially what's going on, even though they don't have to go to that extra step. And so, uh, you know, as the example goes, imagine, say, a million people over the course of a whole season uh, purchase tickets to see his home games. Uh, that would give Wilt $250,000, which uh, you might just stipulate is more than anybody else has in, in, in D1. So I, I will say this here, that this uh, particular number is uh, uh, sort of ripped from the headlines, as it were, because pretty much while uh, Nozick was writing this, uh, Wilt Chamberlain indeed did sign a, a, a contract to play for a whopping $250,000 a year, which at the time was one of the richest uh, athletic contracts ever given out. Um, and that's uh, that's kind of incredible, uh, given that uh, these days, uh, like $250,000 is uh, probably somewhat like half or less than the league minimum of most major American sports. So uh, it, it doesn't seem to translate it. Now, of course, you have to adjust that for inflation, but still, um, even given that, there there seems to be just a lot more money in, in, in sports these days uh, than, than there was at the time. But, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's just it's sort of an interesting side note. So notice what's happened here. Uh, this is the this is this the this argument is contained in the section of the reading that is uh, has the header over it called you know liberty how liberty upsets patterns right I mean and so what Nozick's point here is is just that that liberty upsets patterns right if you let people voluntarily exchange things and make various kinds of deals and agreements uh, whatever pattern you started with is going to be messed up at some at some level. And so now, essentially, we have changed D1 into a whole different distribution uh, and a much more unequal one in, in all likelihood. Uh, and so this new distribution, let's call it D2, uh, certainly no longer fits our pattern. Right? That's the, that's the theory of this argument. And it does contain a fair amount of inequality. Uh, but of course, the question is, is it unjust? 
Nozick, of course, thinks not, right? You know, at, at, you know, saying is this unjust is something of a rhetorical question from Nozick's perspective, uh, and it certainly seems like there's there seems to be nothing wrong with how it came to be that D1 became D2, right? And so uh, this is Nozick's way of trying to say, look, it, it's it's really important to pay attention to how things came about, to pay attention to process uh, every bit as much, perhaps even more than uh, actual outcome. Right. And so that's that's a, a, an enduring uh, uh, debt, I think, that we owe to, to Nozick for pointing this particular uh, kind of an idea out. So that's the Wilt Chamberlain argument. And I think at this point, what we want to do is, is sort of mirror Rawls here and say, OK, uh, after we saw Rawls's theory and some examples of how it works, we've seen here Nozick's theory, some examples of how it works. Uh, and so we want to get a, a step back and take a, a look at some of uh, the notable features of this kind of a theory of justice. Right. So uh, the first one that we're going to take a look at is that Nozick's theory uh, is, is very strongly what you call libertarian. Um, just like uh, uh, Rawls's theory was uh, very strongly egalitarian. Now, I want to take this opportunity to clear up something that, that might otherwise be confusing. We're using libertarian in a, in, in a more general context than we typically mean when we talk about libertarianism in politics, right? Or, or, or specifically the libertarian party in the United States or, you know, and other countries have libertarian parties as well. But I mean, uh, I especially want to distinguish uh, libertarianism in this sense from libertarianism in that sense, right? So political libertarianism uh, is the view it is is a view applied by political scientists uh, to folks that tend have a tendency to be more conservative on uh, uh, sort of uh, economic issues and some some uh, governmental policy issues uh, and more uh, liberal on social issues right that that tends that's that's what political scientists tend to say about uh, libertarian views in this case we only mean by libertarian that the system values liberty highly it may be true of many actual like political libertarians that they value liberty highly but that's all we really mean here we don't mean to say that oh well Nozick would have been in the libertarian party uh, or something like he may not have been I don't know I'm not sure what he would have thought of our current libertarian party uh, so uh, that's, I just, again, wanted to disambiguate those things. We're using the same word, but we're not using it in exactly the same way. There may be indeed some overlap, uh, but I, I'm not going to, you know, commit Nozick or anyone else to any, any real overlap. All we really mean here by libertarian is that the theory values liberty highly, just like um, if there was an egalitarian party. I don't know if Rawls would be a part of that or not, but his theory does value equality highly. So uh, that's uh, the way that, that's, that's one very important contrast. And I want to point that contrast out because it seems to be one of those cases where as reasonable as both Rawls's theory and Nozick's theory are, this is sort of one more place where they can't both be right. Okay. Um, Rawls, for example, thinks it's really important how things turn out uh, to decide whether some distribution is just. And he doesn't think it's very important how they, how they get that way so much. Uh, Nozick thinks the opposite. He thinks it's very much more important why, how things turn out the way they, or, you know, what, what, what process things take to turn out how they do, and not as important how they actually turn out. Uh, that's one very big difference between them. Another very big difference between them is that uh, uh, Rawls' views, uh, value, Rawls's theory tends to value equality very highly, and liberty, though it values it, values it somewhat less. Right. Nozick's theory has the opposite bent. It values liberty very highly. And though it may be said to value equality, at least to some degree, it values it less. OK. Uh, and it's one of those things where you can see probably at least some 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 I inherent trade off between uh, liberty and equality. Right. It might be that the most possible liberty uh, is, is a state of, of lesser equality and the most possible equality is a state where some are required to sacrifice at least some liberty. There's probably, you know, at least some optimum, right? But uh, uh, Nozick is going to argue for, you know, more liberty than equality, and 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 Rawls is going to argue for more equality than liberty, right? That's that's uh, a major difference between them. And of course, one of the other interesting things about uh, Nozick's theory here is that at least some coercive elements of society, for example, taxation, right? I mean, you know, the, the sort of thing. I mean, we mean coercive in the sense that you don't really get a choice whether you, you want to pay your taxes or not. They're not they're not optional, okay? Uh, and things like contract enforcement. If you say, you know, I think I'd like to just not fulfill this contract that I that I that I signed or pledged, um, 
And, uh, you know, someone says, well, you, you can't do that. You know, we're going to have, you know, law enforcement is going to enforce that contract. Uh, you're you're going to be sort of, you know, put in, in jail for, you know, essentially fraud, right? Uh, and you say, well, I don't want to be put in jail for, well, you don't get a choice. Okay. So there's a sense in which, uh, you know, basic law and order uh, is to some degree necessarily coercive. Uh, go back to your Locke and and, uh, and Hobbes for that. And you'll see that that's, that's basically true. Uh, and these kinds of elements of society, because, um, uh, because, uh, Nozick focuses so strongly on voluntary exchange, right, on all these sort of liberty aspects, uh, places where uh, we sort of lack liberty in society, uh, where things are not optional, uh, are going to require some special justification. Um, Nozick, for example, is very skeptical about, um, you know, taxation used for certain purposes, um, but he's not in general uh, going to deny that taxation is an important part of having a society. And so in some sense, he says, look, society is going to have to uh, have some of these kinds of coercive elements. And in fact, uh, if you look at where he describes his entitlement theory, where he talks about justice of acquisition or justice in transfer, uh, he talks about he talks about redistribution to make up for things like fraud or uh, you know sort of other or other you know theft or fraud or something like that. So the idea of somebody somebody steals something from you, it might be okay to coercively take that thing from the person who stole it and give it back to the person it rightfully belongs to. Okay, that's absolutely coercive, uh, but it's going to fit with some very sensible principles of justice and transfer. So uh, again, it's one of those things where uh, uh, any coercive element in a society is going to have to have some 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 special justification, and that can be a challenge uh, for 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 Nozick's view. And it's a challenge that that Rawls's view doesn't have as much. Uh, if anything, Rawls's view may have the opposite uh, problem of uh, perhaps having too many uh, uh, coercive elements, uh, and that's. Uh, certainly something it's criticized for. So you see here another element where uh, uh, one perspective and the other perspective uh, are very much at odds. And so uh, what I'd like to do at this point is take uh, a quick few moments to allow uh, somebody like Rawls uh, to respond to the entitlement theory, because of course, uh, uh, you know, the theory of justice uh, gets written in 1971, uh, anarchy, state, and utopia gets written in 1974, um, and so to some extent, uh, we, we have the benefit. Uh, Nozick has the benefit of, of having Rawls's theory to sort of react against, uh, and I think uh, I don't want to say, oh well, I don't want to, what I don't want to be doing here is presenting uh, Nozick's view as if it's an outright refutation of Rawls's view. It isn't, but it certainly is something else to think about, and you might very much prefer Nozick's theory to Rawls's theory once you see them stacked up side by side. Uh, but again, I don't want to present the, the view that I think that one is a refutation of the other, uh, or that one is, uh, the reason I'm presenting them both is because they're both very good theories. Um, and what's very unfortunate is that they cannot both be true. So here are some responses that somebody might plausibly give to the entitlement theory. We've seen some criticisms of Rawls's view as a patterned view, namely that liberty tends to upset patterns. Uh, but uh, we should also see that, that Nozick's view has at least some troubles as well. I mean, again, none that I think are fatal to the view, but, but, but they are troubles nonetheless. And those two uh, uh, responses are first, uh, something called the fallacy of composition, uh, and second, uh, this uh, idea that the Wilt-Chamberlain argument might perhaps stop too soon, right? There might be other things uh, going on there. So we'll take a look at each of these in turn. Uh, first off, let's take a look at the fallacy of composition. Uh, the fallacy of composition is related to another fallacy called the fallacy of division, uh, and these are both fallacies of confusing parts and wholes. OK, uh, so you might say something like, well, look, you know, the, the Chrysler building, you might say, is the most beautiful building in New York. But that doesn't mean that it has the most beautiful rivets in New York. That's an example of the fallacy of division. Something that's true of a whole thing is not necessarily true of any of its parts. OK, the fallacy of composition is to reason the, the opposite way in error, right? To say something is, you know, some feature of the parts translates to some feature of the holes. One very common example you will very often see of this in, in sort of everyday life um, is in athletics. So imagine you assemble a team with all of the best individual players, right? You say, well, this this person is the best at this. This person's the best at that. This person's the best. And you just put them all together on the same team. Well, it's not always true that what you get is the best actual team, right? Uh, so e just because each of the individual players is the best doesn't mean that the team that they're on will be the best, right? This is again a fallacy of composition. Now I will say, okay, if you're trying to make the best team, getting the best players is certainly a good strategy to try. But I think we all understand that there's no guarantee here, right? 
uh, that's uh, that's essentially the fallacy of composition, right? If you put all the you know the best you know again, if you use all the most beautiful carpet in the world, that doesn't necessarily mean you have the most beautiful room in the world, right? Or something like that. It, these are all uh, examples of the fallacy of composition. Now, of course, uh, th some things are compositional. Okay, uh, so if you you know say that uh, you know a, a drop of water will will you know get something wet, well then a, a bucket of water will also get something wet, right? Because you know the 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 the, the you know the wetness making power that the water has uh is uh you know it's compositional it, it you know more water will get things wet because less water will also get things wet right so uh, there's a sense in which sometimes things are compositional in that way uh some things uh, are actually divisional right uh so for example if one whole wheel of limburger cheese is stinky well then a small wedge of limburger cheese is also going to be stinky right and so again some things are div divisible so it's not like uh the you know composition or division are always errors but they sometimes are and that's going to be the the accusation here is that Nozick's theory is uh, committing the fallacy of composition. So let's see how that works. So the idea is that just because some distribution right is composed of acts that are individually just does not necessarily mean that the distribution as a whole is a just distribution. Again, there may be an illegitimate movement from features of parts to features of the whole. Right. So I want to uh, hear some 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 more detail. Uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Julian Sanchez, who wrote a really excellent article that I, I don't remember how I stumbled across it online. It's uh, just a, a blog post, really, but it's a very intelligently written, uh, very incisive blog post. And so, you know, kudos to Julian Sanchez, who I, I don't otherwise know anything about. Um, but, you know, here it is. This is, you know, a quote, uh, you know, you can Google it and you'll find it uh, in the original if you want to read the whole thing. Um, so here's a quote from that. It says, finally, and perhaps most importantly, the intuitive appeal of the argument rests on the tacit premise that if D1, remember that's the first part of the Walt Chamberlain argument, is just, and the micro transfers, everybody's ticket buying, that lead from D1 to D2 are individually morally permissible, then the macro distribution D2 effectively inherits the justice of the micro steps, right? Uh, this is a, a very well put. Uh, Sanchez continues. He says, suppose it is the case that many producers emit as a byproduct of industrial activity a variety of chemicals into the atmosphere. Further, suppose that for each individual factory, right, for each factory, its individual emissions make no perceptible difference in the surrounding air quality. But the combined effect of all of these gases emitted by thousands of producers uh, mixing produces some catastrophic ecological effect. Each producer can claim that his emissions inflict no harm when considered in isolation. The ecological catastrophe, should it occur, nevertheless clearly constitutes a serious harm to the health and property of others in a way that may plausibly be said to violate their rights, whether or not that violation can be ascribed to any individual actor. Right. So I think this is a really excellent example of uh, the fallacy of composition in progress, right? Where you might say, okay, look, just because each individual person does no real harm doesn't mean that they all acting in concert do no harm. Again, if you imagine washing your clothes in a river, like one person washing their clothes in a river, no effect on anything, really. Uh, but now a million people wash their clothes in the same river, and now, well, now, now you can start worrying about the effects of pollution uh, harming uh, other things that the river is, is uh, used for and, and required for. Okay, so again, just because one individual action is, is not objectionable in and of itself doesn't mean that a whole, the, the whole, right, the whole situation uh, is also unobjectionable, right? That is, the macro situation doesn't inherit the justice of all of the micro transfers that lead to it. He gives another analogy that's also very good. He says, by analogy with voting, each voter, at least in a national election, can reasonably point out that her vote makes no difference to the outcome of the election, yet the outcome is nevertheless the joint product of all of these individual votes. Even an election decided by one vote, it's not any one person who is the person that decided the election, right? Um, it's it's in some sense all of them, right? And and, uh, and so again, the features of parts, features of holes are not the same thing as features of parts, uh, and vice versa. And it's possible that uh, Nozick's entitlement theory may run afoul of this. Uh, it may well be that that transfers and acquisitions that are just in and of themselves may may absolutely lead to situations that themselves are unjust even though the micro transfers that led to them the micro steps that led to them uh, are are uh, themselves perfectly just
right? So that's one possible way that people have responded to the Wilt Chamberlain argument. Another way that you might imagine people uh, responding to the Wilt Chamberlain argument is to say something like, well, the argument stops too soon, right? So what we do is we have D1, we have Wilt's contract, and then Wilt is rich, and now we're in D2, okay? And the idea is to, to look at this uh, sort of very stark difference. But again, there's, there's, there's more going on. There might be more going on. And so uh, again, this is a, another point where uh, you, you'll want to sort of, you know, pause the video and think about it. You know, maybe write down a, a quick short list, three, four, five items here. Consider that Wilt cannot get rich playing basketball without what, right? What, is rich, what does Wilt actually need in order to get rich playing basketball, right? And again, think very basically, right? Don't, don't uh, you know, don't, don't get uh, uh, too, too distracted with uh, things that aren't, uh, things that are less obvious, right? Okay. So I, again, I trust you, you, you pause it a little bit, think about a few of these things. Again, you'll probably come up with at least some of these things. Um, so number one, a basketball league. Okay. Right. You know, he can't, he can't get, so nobody's going to see him, you know, just like practice all by himself. Uh, no one's going to, going to watch him and his own teammates have a scrimmage. Uh, no one's going to pay very much money to see that. Uh, really the league is the product, right? Not just, uh, Wilt. Wilt might be a big draw, but the league provides a kind of structure wherein people can actually get into things, right? Um, people can, you know, sort of essentially root for, for the clothes of their city to defeat the clothes of the opposing city, right? I mean, that's a, a major part of, of what leagues do. They, they invoke, you know, various kinds of civic pride and, and loyalty. Uh, and that's part of what drives their value and uh, the, the, the sort of money that people are willing to spend on it. So uh, certainly he needs a basketball league, right? Um, and, and, you know, that that's not free. Those don't think those don't occur naturally. Um, they have to be maintained and, uh, uh, you know, and, and funded and, and, and taken care of and all that sort of stuff. He needs a place to play. OK, and so that includes, uh, you know, a city, for example, um, and, you know, and cities, again, they don't necessarily occur naturally so much, right, that, that they're, you know, they're, they're things that people make intentionally. Um, they uh, also, when we refer to a place to play, we mean the arena itself, right, the actual court. Um, and and, and f most of those, especially these days, are, are built with uh, at least substantially public money, um, you know, that is tax money, right? And so, again, uh, in order, and, and they're, they're seen to, you know, drive economic activity in a, in a city as well as be something that's, you know, just sort of nice for a city to have this kind of uh, entertainment. So uh, the place, uh, a place to play, you know, an actual arena, that those things aren't free, right? They're in fact fairly expensive and, and they require at least some maintenance, right? And so there, there's that too. It's part of the overhead. Uh, of course, there's a great deal of public infrastructure involved to say nothing of the stadium uh, or arena itself. Uh, that is, there has to be a road system for people to get there, okay? And again, that's not free. Uh, that has to be maintained. Um, there's a communications infrastructure. If we're talking about televising games, putting them on the radio, advertising them, uh, telling people where the games are, when they are. Uh, I mean, again, that's all public infrastructure. None of that's free either. All of that requires maintenance and, and construction and, and uh, you know, continual uh, investment and reinvestment. Uh, of course, you have to have a society in which people actually have disposable income. So before anybody can give up their money voluntarily to buy a ticket to see Wilt play basketball, they actually have to have money to buy a ticket with, right? That's certainly an absolute requirement. Uh, so you have to live in a society in which people have disposable income to begin with. That's also not free. That doesn't simply happen because because it just happens. Uh, that has to be done on purpose, intentionally, and it takes an awful lot of work and investment uh, to maintain a society of any kind, especially one where people uh, are thriving. And of course, uh, uh, I, I, this is one that I, I I perhaps don't think. If you had this on your list, you should pat yourself on the back for thinking of things at their most abstract level. Nobody can get rich, of course, without the existence of money. Okay, uh, there has to actually be money. But again, think of yourself, is, is money something that just occurs naturally, right? Well, of course not, right? Now, some of the things people have used as currency uh, occur naturally, like various like shells and salt and gold and things like that, but that's not money, that's currency, okay? That's, that's different stuff. Money is, is a social invention. You have to have a well-functioning society with law and order, with a banking system, with a financial system, right? And all of that stuff uh, is, is necessary to have money exist and it's not free and it doesn't happen just by accident. It has to be, again, maintained and invested in, constructed, reinvested in, and looked after. And, and it's not free. 
Okay. So again, this is a very short list. You can, you can probably think of many, many more things. And I'm sure that you probably did think of things that didn't make this list. And, and I assure you, you're right. He does need those things too. Right. And, but, but, but look at your list and say, how many of those things just occur naturally that we get for free that we don't have to maintain or reinvest in. Right. And I, pretty much sure you're going to come up with a bunch that say that you're not at all. If you do come up with some that, you know, you think really hard, really just occur naturally and free and, and all that stuff, uh, go ahead and you know, put that in the discussion board, right? I mean, that'd be cool. So, uh, but in any case, I think it, it, the, the, the idea is we could, you can come up with ideas of lots and lots of things that require all this reinvestment that in order for anybody to get rich doing anything, you have to have all this stuff uh, and all that stuff has to be maintained. And so maybe it makes sense to uh, at some level say, OK, so because everybody stands the opportunity to sort of, you know, get rich in the system doing something uh, that, you know, if you do get rich doing something that you have to kick in perhaps a little more than the average person uh, to keep it going. Right. And that's again, that's that's the theory behind why just about every society has a kind of graduated tax structure where, you know, the more you have, the more you pay. Um, and so, again, it might be a matter of justice that at least some or perhaps much income is redistributed to cover the costs of maintaining all of the above. And in that case, the example may actually contain substantially more patterned elements and substantially less inequality than Nozick makes it look like. Right. Uh, perhaps D2 deviates from a pattern uh, very little or even not at all, uh, even uh, considering all of the voluntary transfer that occurs between D1 and D2 because of all this further redistribution that might seem perfectly reasonable and perfectly just. Right. So that's a, a, another thing to get one thinking about um, uh, some some difficulties that the entitlement theory may face that or at least the Wilt Chamberlain argument for the entitlement theory may face. Right. But, of course, I think that Nozick's overall idea is still very compelling. It still probably does matter quite a bit how things got to be the way they are. And I think it matters quite a bit uh, that, that liberty really, at least intuitively, uh, seems to be able to upset patterns in principle. I, I think that that point is, has to be taken at least to some degree. And so uh, let's talk a little bit here about how to use Nozick's theory for something like social reform. Right. Uh, this one is fairly simple, just like uh, uh, Rawls's theory is fairly simple. You, you know, in Rawls's point of view, you, you, you take a society, you say, all right, would this would this be a society that I would pick if I didn't know who I was going to be in it? With Nozick's theory, you say, OK, how, how have things ended up the way they are? OK, uh, is, how have things ended up the way they are? And is that fair? Right. <laughs> that, that, that's, uh, you know, again, a simple theory means a, a simple application. Um, and all all great theories are at least at some level simple. Uh, and so, again, in any given society, you say you just apply some plausible set of rules for just acquisition and just transfer to at least recent holdings. Um, when you go back far enough, I mean, there are epistemic problems here. Like, for example, um, you know, if you have, uh, you know, like, you know, artifacts that are that are that are in a museum or something like that, you know, um, so mm -hmm. some museum dug them out of the ground and it seems like they have them in some sense rightfully now. But, uh, you know, what if what if that that, you know, sort of stone knife was stolen from some other person back in distant prehistory? Again, we can't we can't worry about that. That's not actually going to be that important to us. Um, and, and and that doesn't, again, impugn the, the basic idea of Nozick's theory. It's just one of those things that we have to deal with is that, uh, you know, we're not going all the way back to the very beginning of time on everything. So, um, you know, certainly if you if you go back far enough, you're going to find some kinds of problems. But but at some point you have to, to sunset that. Um, and again, expect controversial cases, expect cases where it's really difficult to know what the best rules would be. Uh, but really, most rules of just acquisition and just transfer are pretty clear. Right. You know, things like voluntary exchange, gift uh, and, uh, you know, are, are, are fine, theft, bad. OK, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, so that, that's uh, essentially the method for using Nozick's theory to determine things about uh, about uh, social justice. And so finally, let's take a look at just the summary, the, the big ideas that uh, we want to get out of uh, out of all this. Right. Uh, again, the details are important and it's it's important to remember where uh, in, in the story all those details go. But it's also a, a key to know what the story is. And so here's here's the story. Um, one thing to remember is that the entitlement theory is strongly libertarian. Again, libertarian in the sense that it values liberty very highly, uh, just like Rawls's theory is one that where it ends up valuing equality very highly, being an egalitarian theory. So libertarian and egalitarian are Im important uh, terms that you're gonna you're you're just going to see in a lot of later material and in later discussion. So uh, so know those well. 
Also, the central insight of uh, Nozick's theory is that procedures matter. Okay, it matters. It matters how things came to be the way they are, not just how they are at any given time. So procedures matter, and and Nozick thinks that they matter even more than outcomes. Right, and that that's certainly a plausible view, and it's a view that provides a great deal of tension uh, between Nozick's theory and theories like, say, Rawls's, uh, that that do think that outcomes matter more than processes or procedures. And finally, uh, this will be a, a, an enduring level of um, uh, dispute for us, uh, is what role inequality has uh, toward justice. Um, in Rawls's theory, if you'll recall, uh, inequality is uh, largely indicative right, of injustice, unless that inequality uh, is net beneficial to the whole or beneficial to the least advantaged. Right? And it's a, it's a very, very strict test. Uh, uh, in general, inequality is not to be desired uh, in, from when you're looking at society from behind the veil of ignorance. For Nozick, though, inequality all by itself isn't a problem. Right? Inequality, he wants to say, is not necessarily injustice. Uh, and again, this is a, a, another uh, aspect of tension. And we're going to talk talk uh, about what relationship is there between inequality and injustice uh, in society. So we're going to see a, a whole variety of different perspectives on just this issue. And so uh, it, again, makes sense to keep track of where uh, our, our first couple of major theories, Rawls's theory and Nozick's theory, stand with respect to the status of inequality. So given all those ideas, uh, Nozick has provided us with a, a very interesting uh, alternate proposal uh, of distributive justice uh, to Rawls's theory.